and welcome to the 161st edition of the Illegal Motion College Football Podcast. In Nashville, Tennessee, I'm the professor, Matt Perkins. And a quick fade across the Harpeth River from me here in the Music City, it's our own offensive coordinator, the coach, Corey Burton. What's going on, man? Uh, decided to be here. <laughs> it was a, ended up being a great weekend of college football, lots of stuff happening, and uh, ready to get into it. Absolutely. Well, we can't get into it without our third amigo in the second city, a man who never fair catches a punt. It's our intrepid blogger from Big Ten and Counting, Josh Cook. This is dangerously close to an early burying the lead. Let's get it to the show, Matt. Yeah, it's hard. Well, it's hard to bury it when you leave with it. But um, eating with the lead, who would have ever done that? Um, we had a Saturday full of upsets and blowouts. We'll get to that in just a second. First, quick update on how we did against the spreads this weekend. Horribly. Uh, guys, uh, much better week against the odds for us yes you you gentlemen you you gentlemen were both three and two i went four and one we were all just the wrong side of south florida and illinois south florida won but did not cover uh but we all correctly picked syracuse vandy and kansas rock chalk baby i didn't buy on hawaii's chances on that six hour time difference and that kept that's what was the difference here uh army's favored by six and a half one by seven so uh, on the season, you guys are both at five and ten now. I'm at eight and seven. Uh, so uh, with that update, let's head out to our quick slants. And Josh, uh, you are uh, intrigued by uh, the part of the country that's currently getting hit by what is now, I believe, tropical depression, Florence. Yeah, it seems like each year one of us kind of finds a conference outside of our home conference that we just fall in love with. And I have uh, fallen in love with the ACC race. I think both conferences have a uh, clear favorite at this point, a whole bunch of giant killers. There's some great storylines that could go into Duke, but I'm not. I'm going to go with two teams that I watched their games almost in their entirety. And the first was Boston college and wake forest. That was a 41 34 shootout. The offensive talent on both sides of the ball was really exciting. I'm curious how both those teams will do against Clemson. I think with A.J. Dillon in that bruising running game, Boston College might have the better chance at being a giant killer if either team pulls the upset. But both played some really fun football last Thursday night. And then the other one was was a blowout, but I couldn't turn away. I was so fixated by Syracuse, Florida State, just the Seminoles' offensive line imploding every play. It was like a soap opera. At one point, DeAndre Francois refused to be helped up by his offensive lineman that gave up yet another sack. Uh, I can't blame him. I would be pissed too. And this leads to my questionable coaching decision. I know it's a long shot, Coach, but when Florida State scored to make it 23-6, to I'm screaming at the TV for them to do a two-point conversion. They kicked the point after. So uh, what is on that little chart that says 23 to 7 is more desirable than 23 to 8? Because unless my math is wrong, three touchdowns and three two two-point conversions wins you the game. Yeah, I'm not sure uh, at that point in the game um, that – you have to go off the chart. I'm thinking the chart goes out the window, and you're pretty much in two-point mode. I think, honestly, that Willie Taggart left the chart in Eugene. (laughs) Well, even then, he probably would have gone for two had he he not known, but I don't know. You know what he was thinking? Well, I don't know what the hell he was thinking. I guess he thought he felt so good about his team because they'd been playing so well up until that point that he could get four scores instead of three, so... I don't know. Maybe that's his rationale. To me, he was quitting on the game. He didn't care that the, that the touchdown even mattered. So as someone who grew up in western New York and who, whose first football love was Syracuse, this game made me so happy. This game made me so ecstatic. I was sad for Eric Dungy, obviously, that he got injured. Uh, but, uh, man, Tommy DeVito, uh, he looked pretty good there uh, coming in as the backup. Uh cool. Well, I'll tell you what, we might have to rethink the Carrier Dome in terms of home field advantage if they're just going to have that much humidity. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Well, so I'm going to do my first slant to just vent, basically, about the Wisconsin game. I need to get this off my chest so that we can have a, uh, a a more positive show. But, 
you know, my weekend was obviously marred by the Badger loss at home to BYU, uh, 24 to 21, snapping a 41 game non conference home winning streak. That at the time was the second largest in the country. Now, I think there are about four real reasons that the Badgers underperformed here. Oh, it actually starts with the offensive line. Now, obviously, Wisconsin coming into the season, you're thinking this could be, you know, an all timer great dominant line. Well, this game against the Cougars was one of the most underwhelming performances that I've seen from this unit since the Gary Anderson era. They were consistently pushed around by BYU's front. They did not open up the usual running lanes. It was so bad in the third quarter that offensive coordinator and who's also the offensive line coach, Joe Rudolph, subbed in the entire second unit when the Badgers were down a touchdown. Now, I know it was hot, but this was like pretty early in the third quarter. There would not have been a fatigue thing going on at that point. You're just pretty fresh coming out of halftime. This was to light a fire under their rear ends, and it kind of worked. Wisconsin offensive line looked a little bit better in the second half, but that did not end up making enough of a difference. Hopefully, it's a wake-up call for what should be among the best, if not the number one offensive line in the nation. The defensive line was also no better than their offensive counterpart. It's very clear that when nose tackle Lide Sakapolu is out of the game, the Badgers can be run on. I don't know what the answer is there. They've got a true freshman backing him up, and Bryson Williams has you know, a couple of good moments every game, but there are a lot of times that he really looks like a freshman out there going against, you know, you know, much uh, older and stronger, even though he's a very strong kid, much stronger offensive lineman. He's getting pushed around a little bit for the first time in his life. I think he's starting to, to realize what football is at the next level. So when Sagapolo and his 340 backflipping pounds are not out there, they have a lot of issues. They've already had a ton of injuries on the D line and that has not helped, but getting Isaiah louder milk back at, almost full strength will help at defensive end, but still they've got a lot of improvement there to do. Third, Alex Hornbrook was downright terrible. He played his worst game, at least by the eye test since his second career start, which was against Michigan in Ann Arbor and where he got picked off twice and had a pick six and whatnot. But after that, you know, since then he's shown a fair amount of improvement, but this game was, not just one step back. This game was three steps back, quite frankly. The numbers are you know, not horrible, actually. 18 for 28 for 190 yards at a pick, but frankly, it should have been three interceptions. There were at least two dropped interceptions uh, by BYU. He's still underthrowing guys a lot. And if he gets stymied against a very strong Iowa defense this weekend, like, honestly, I kind of expect him to. I am going to be leading the Jack Cohn for starter campaign. And finally... This is one of the first games that I can remember in which Coach Paul Christ was, frankly, outcoached. They did not make any adjustments defensively to stop the jet sweep. They let Squally Canada run wild, even though he was really their only offense. Tanner Mangum was not really that effective. But, you know, they had that one uh, trick play, the double pass that freshman safety Scott Nelson bid on, and left the guy wide open behind him in the end zone. And then the offensive play calling left something to be desired. They use basically zero pre-snap motion, which has been a staple of Chris' scheme for years. And has also been very helpful and effective for Hornerbrook because it makes the defense basically declare their coverage before the snap. There was none of that in this game. So that was pretty frustrating to, to watch. So, you know, the whole Big Ten slate is still in front of them. But if they lose to Iowa this weekend, their season is effectively over. Okay, rant over. <laughs> Josh, uh, speaking of the Big Ten losers. He seemed unusually calm there. Yeah, he did. Well, you know, I, I, I tried to just have my thoughts be measured. Fair and enough. And I just, I just wanted to get it all out. You yeah. didn't go screaming a Perkins there. <laughs> uh, you know what? I would not do very well as a caller on the Paul Feinberg show. <laughs> <laughs> Fair 
Fair enough. What do you mean, Paul? Roll down. <laughs> uh, well, so uh, my quick well, slant kind of uh, builds off Matt's, and I was just going to uh, give my thoughts on each of the terrible losses the Big Ten just totally face-planted this weekend. Um, seems like it was a survive and advance day, Indiana, Iowa, uh, Minnesota, they managed to survive. Michigan State got to have the weekend off. Um, so I'm going to give just my real quick thoughts on each of the games. And I'll start with the one Matt just went through. And to me, the biggest takeaway I have, I have about this game is really some of the hubris. I think the best thing that explains uh, Wisconsin's play calling and being so conservative is they didn't want to put anything on tape. They wanted to go into league play 3-0, and bust out some new plays against Iowa, bust out some new plays on the road at Penn State, bust out some new plays against Michigan, and they thought they would just fly through these games and they didn't really have a plan B once BYU started to push them. That's my thoughts on that game. Uh, Kansas, 55-14 to 14 winners over Rutgers. Uh, this one comes down to Chris Ash. He's not the right man for the job. Fantastic coordinator but just has no offense yet again and just throwing true freshman quarterback Artur Satowski to the Wolves. Left him in the game, the majority of the game, even though Kansas kept picking him off. His final stat line, 7 of 19, 47 yards, three interceptions. Why are you leaving that true freshman in there? You've got other options on that roster. They're not very good but they've at least played Big Ten football. They would not have gotten embarrassed in Lawrence. Uh, Temple took down Maryland. Uh, Maryland, to me, just fell into that trap of an 0-2 team, sometimes the most dangerous club you have to face, and they just were not sharp. They were not very efficient running the ball, and Kasim Hill had just a miserable day passing the ball. And... I know he was injured last year, so his true freshman season is essentially this year. Uh, but 7 of 17, 56 yards, that, that's dreadful. So Maryland has got to return to being balanced. Nebraska versus Troy, simple. Nebraska doesn't have a quarterback. They had one guy on roster with a scholarship. He couldn't play. You saw Nebraska's offense really, really struggle. Illinois. Bright spot in their loss. They gave South Florida a battle. South Florida is receiving votes. South Florida is going to be ranked at some point soon this season. Uh, Moral victories are such a cliche, but when you are as dreadful as Illinois is, this at least shows some growth. Purdue, you got to find some defense, my friends. And finally, Northwestern. Mm -hmm. Northwestern. Oh, boy. They're back-to-back losses. Uh... They are beyond sloppy. They are the most turnover-prone team in the league. They had a bunch of giveaways against Akron, three of them, in fact, and all three of them were taken to the end zone. Two pick sixes and a scoop and score for the Zips. This coming off of a loss against Duke where they had two other interceptions. So, Northwestern, you are a good team. Hang on to the ball for the love of God. Yeah, it was a rough weekend all around. You know, coming into the show, I was trying to figure out what was the worst loss amongst all those teams. I think you could make a case for Wisconsin, Northwestern, Nebraska, or Rutgers. And I I, want to say Nebraska, but like you said, Josh, they're – they they don't have a quarterback, so yeah. it's really hard to hold to hold them to the same standard that you do a Wisconsin team that's at pretty much full strength. Uh, I I think the it's a no brainer honestly who had the worst loss. Rutgers is playing what's considered the worst Power Five team in the country, one of probably the five or six worst programs in college football. And they're down 31-14 at halftime. They're not competitive for the entire game. The mantle's been passed. Rutgers is worse than Oregon State. Rutgers is worse than Kansas. Rutgers is the worst Power 5 team 
And uh, I mean, so I mean, you put, I, you put Rutgers against UTEP. You put Rutgers against. Yeah, I know Rutgers beat Texas State, but like, uh, you put Rutgers in the Sun Belt. I'm not sure how many conference games they're winning. I talked to my dad yesterday. My dad's a Rutgers alum. For those of you who don't know, mm-hmm. he has decided to completely dissociate himself <laughs> with, 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 with all athletics program. My dad was a varsity athlete at Rutgers, and he's decided oh. to completely dissociate himself with um, Rutgers athletics. Here are the stats just to show how complete this whipping was for Rutgers. Uh, total yards, 274 to 544. Good Lord. Passing yards, really close, 124 to 144. Rushing yards, 150 to uh, um, 400 rushing yards for Kansas. Uh, Chris Ash was a defensive coordinator. I feel like that should be added. Uh, turnovers. Uh, Coach, I have a feeling that no team has ever won a game doing this, but Rutgers lost the turnover battle 6 to nothing. It was total domination. Good grief. Good grief. Um, Coach... Uh, well, hold on. One one more thing that I want to throw out there. Just, Coach has just waited patiently. We're just devolved into a Big Ten show. That's how bad the weekend went. Do you know the last time that Kansas had a winning streak? The last time Kansas had a winning streak? When was the last time that Kansas won consecutive games? Uh, I think they had a five-win season, I want to say, in – uh, 2009, 2010, somewhere around there. There was a five. There was a five-win season in 2009. Did they have consecutive wins that year? What about when it, it's actually? It's actually more recently than then. Oh, then uh, maybe I want to say maybe in David Beatty's second year. I think they might have won and beat an FCS team and then a non-conference opponent. It was 2011, Turner Gill's final season. They won, oh God! They, they won the first two games versus McNeese State. In northern Illinois, which is impressive. Is it? And, and then they went and lost their final 10 games. Well, that sounds more like it. Yeah. So, anyhow, Coach, uh, what have you got for, for your slam here? Well, I was looking at our list, and I didn't see one of the uh, SEC's best games, and that was Vanderbilt at Notre Dame. It wasn't billed as a great game at the beginning, but it turned out to be one that got really interesting. So um, what stuck out, what stood out to me was, uh, you know, it came down to, you know, a a clutch fourth down stop from, from safety Jalen Elliott, where he, uh, he knocked the ball loose on a huge, huge fourth down play. And Elliott came up huge in this, uh, Elliott's come up huge this season so far because, um, he's had a uh, he had a pair of interceptions last week against um, Ball State. So uh, Kyle Shermer had a, had a pretty good game there three three hundred twenty six yards and a touchdown for Vanderbilt. Uh, they were down sixteen to three at half. Um, so it, it was one of those games where you know you were starting to think ah this is you know typical Vanderbilt. They're about to he- here we go. They've hung around for a little bit. Now they're getting ready to get blown out, and it never happened. Uh, they finished with 420 total yards, um, and they outgained the Irish 420 to 380. Um, and it, it was it was just one of those games where Notre Dame just never really could put them away. Brandon Wimbush threw three interceptions in this in this game. That doesn't help. And when you turn the ball over, anybody can beat you. But Notre Dame was fortunate in this one. Um, what what uh, what I got from Vanderbilt is they couldn't really. <laughs> Get anything on the ground um, early on, uh, and and they finally kind of figured it out. But you know, it was uh, but Vanderbilt was you know they 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 impressed me. They impressed me a lot. You know, just just when just when I thought they were going to be typical Vanderbilt, they weren't. And and Derek Mason has actually starting to to turn the corner here with them. Not not that I'm saying they're going to be an SEC power ever, but it's just one of those things where you know you have a veteran quarterback and. He goes into a road game and, and just stays calm, keeps the guys in it, and they just – again, if you've ever heard the term keep chopping wood, keep chopping wood, keep chopping, keep chopping, keep chopping, Kirby Smart says it all the time. It's actually an overused cliche, uh, to be honest with you. So, um, And it makes reference to if you've ever chopped down a big tree. 
and you keep chopping. You chop. You're not making any progress. You chop. No progress. Chop. No progress. Chop. No progress. And all of a sudden, the tree falls. So uh, Vanderbilt wasn't on the end of the scoreboard that they wanted to be. But, again, pretty impressive showing for the Commodores. Uh, they uh, they fall to 2-1 and one overall in the season. Um, and, uh, you know, they're, they're going to be a tough out for somebody. And uh, so up next for Vanderbilt is uh, South Carolina. They, That's going to be a fun game. That's going to be a really fun game. They open their SEC season uh, against South Carolina, and the Irish play their first road game at Wake Forest. And Wake Forest is not an easy out either. They uh, I watched them the other night, or parts of their game the other night. Uh, I think it was Thursday night, and they go fast. They're a tempo team. In, in Wake Forest? Game. Yeah. Uh, Josh, uh, one of your favorite players uh, from Wake Forest, Greg Dorch, leads the country in all-purpose yards per game. Yeah, he's a burner. Yeah, he, he's got 224.7 yards per game. That's absolutely outstanding. That leads the country by almost seven yards. I hope he uh, I, I hope he tries the North Texas trick. Oh, that would be fantastic. <laughs> He'd be gone in like two seconds. Hey, we're doing a great job of not burying the lead here. No, I don't know. I don't know what you're referring to. Uh, we're just admiring the Mean Green. I think they played. Uh, I want to say they played a Sun Belt opponent. Did a pretty easy non-conference game. I don't think we're burying anything. Mason oh, okay. Fine is awesome. Fine, and I'm just going to leave it at that. Anyway, well, I mean, I mean, I think he was taking on an FCS team. Now I'm checking my notes. I think, I think they played yeah. Central. Well, why don't you double check on that while I do my final slam? Well, yeah, Chad Morris uh, is in the FCS. I mean, he's coaching some. Uh, team somewhere in the Midwest. It's not important. On last week's preview show, I did a slant on a couple of MAC contests that I thought would make for good matchups. And indeed, they both lived up to the billing. We're going to start in DeKalb, Illinois, where the Huskies held off a second half charge from Central Michigan to win 24 to 16. Northern Illinois quarterback Marcus Childers threw for three scores. Trey Harbison ran for 124 on only 13 carries, nonetheless. Uh, even though the chips outgained and out first down the Huskies, a couple of costly turnovers, including a pick deep in Northern Illinois territory with three minutes left in the game, eventually led to their demise. The Huskies finally get off the schneid after starting 0-2, having faced Utah and Iowa before this game. They're going to be upset-minded next week when they head to Tallahassee to take on a seminal team that is in shambles, I think is the <laughs> most polite way to put it. Uh, meanwhile, the Chippewas cannot afford to overlook their next opponent. Uh, that's right, guys. It's the main Black Bears. They've already beaten Western Kentucky at Western Kentucky this year. They beat a very good New Hampshire team that was a top 10 FCS team at the time. <sighs> you know what? I think the chips could fall here. I, I really mm -hmm. do. But maybe I'll preview that for the weekend. Anyhow, uh, in our second game in the MAC in Buffalo, Tyree Jackson hooked up with receiver KJ Osborne for three. Hey, hey Matt, I gotta I gotta interrupt you on something since yeah. you're bringing it, since you're bringing up Buffalo. Uh, I, I'm just not feeling this show tonight. I think I'm gonna I think I'm just gonna retire. Okay. Well, we're not quite to halftime yet, Josh. So you, you at least have to go out with a little bit of dignity and play out the rest of the first half. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Fonte Davis. <laughs> I, Are you going to go call your grandmother and tell her? Yeah. <laughs> I'm so glad. I'm so glad. This is the first time in like five, five years I haven't gotten Sunday ticket, and I'm so glad I did not spend that money this year. <laughs> I picked the best year to be a Chiefs game. <laughs> so, uh, so Vontae Davis is uh, – he was such an integral part uh, of the hard knocks when they were doing it with the Miami Dolphins. He said, here's one of his best lines. He he was tired at practice, right? So he walks over to his fellow. And I know we're way off the rails here, so I apologize. It doesn't matter. I'm surprised it took us this long to go off the rails. True. <laughs> um, so he's walking around. He goes, he goes, coach, I'm going to take some acting classes. What? Yeah, I'm going to take some acting classes so I can act not to look tired. <laughs> he says, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> yeah, I got to act not to look tired. Then it, gets, then it shows him getting burnt the, the next rep he's in. So, um, 
there you go. Hats yeah. off to you. Great career, so, Bonte. So, so, so kudos to you, who's ever making personnel choices there in Buffalo, on giving Vontae Davis all of his money up front. <sighs> anyway, I'd retire too. Sunny, guys, on the sunny side of town where the Bulls play. You be. Uh, Tyree Jackson hooked up with receiver, receiver KJ Osborne for three scores en route to a 35 21 victory for said Bulls, taking down the previously unbeaten Eagles of Eastern Michigan. Statistically, these teams were pretty much dead even within one yard of total offense uh, of each other in less than a minute's time of possession difference. But Osborne had a 145 of his 188 yards on two huge touchdown plays, a 70-yarder and a 75-yarder. And that was basically the difference in this one. Guys, Buffalo, we we predicted them, at least Josh and I did. I don't know if you did too, Coach, to win the MAC East. But this is a legit team. You know, uh, they should be – you know, they play at Rutgers this week. And honestly – they should be favored by two scores at least mm-hmm. in uh, in Piscataway. I think a more interesting bet would be if Rutgers even gets two scores. And they could be anything. They could be two field goals, two safeties. It doesn't matter. Um, but so, and after that Rutgers game, they have a, a great in-state test against Army, who just beat a very good team in Hawaii. So that'll be a fun game. Um, nonetheless, Eastern needs to regroup quickly. They head out to sunny Southern California to take on San Diego State on Saturday night, who are coming off of a win against Arizona State. Um, so anyhow, before we get to some deep roots, gents, it's pop quiz time. Take out your number two pencils. Let's do it. All right. Guys, against Georgia State on Thursday night, if you guys were tuned in watching a little bit of Thursday night college football, Memphis tailback Darrell Henderson rushed for 233 yards and two scores. This was the second consecutive game with more than 200 yards. If he gets two more 200-yard games this season, he will join a pretty elite club. Since 2000, there have only been 24 players who have had at least four 200 rushing yard games in a single season. Your job is to name those 24 tailbacks. All right. All right, I'll go go first. Yeah, hit it, Coach. All right, uh, it's got to be – one of them's got to be Melvin Gordon. Melvin Gordon is tied for first in that epic 2014 Heisman runner-up season. He had six games over 200 yards. All right. Well, Coach, you and I matched on one because that was my first guess. That was the one I knew 100% for sure. Yeah. Uh, there was the next looking guy. Back that- on the, hold on. Just looking back on that season, if you ever get a chance, go on sportsreference.com uh, in the college football section. Just look at Melvin Gordon's stats from that year. They are – Absolutely insane. Were you going to say they were almost as good as mine? <laughs> I mean, Coach, my creative player, Corey Burton, on NCAA 14 was somehow he, he was the number one recruit in the entire country, even though he was a fullback. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, the world's greatest fullback. Mm-hmm. He ended up. He ended up. I, I at the time I was the coach at Louisiana Lafayette, and he. But you know, he uh, he elected on his own to go to Georgia. So. Smart guy. Yeah. Well, smart I, guy. I think with that note, I am pulling a Devonte Adams. I'll I'll catch you guys later. <laughs> um. Yeah. So now, uh, when you're asking that question, Matt, Monte or uh, Melvin Gordon was my number one. You about said Devonte uh, Davis. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, I don't know why you said Devonte Adams. I was think, I was trying to think of like, are we going deeper on on obscure NFL player cuts? Yep, yeah. we are. Uh, no, Gordon was my first choice. Uh, I was like ninety nine point nine 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 percent sure he was on the list. Uh, next guy, I'm thinking I'm like eighty five to ninety, and it's uh, Donnell Pomfrey over at San Diego State. Donnell Pomfrey is correct. He had four games that he ran for 400 yards, all wins for his San Diego State squad in 2016. Ooh. Ooh. Coach. Ooh. Okay. Um, I'm thinking um, 
he was drafted number one over, or he was drafted number two overall in this past NFL draft. I'm going to go with one Saquon Barkley. Ooh, uh, Saquon uh, only actually two games over 200 yards, um, mm-hmm. both in 2016 and 2017. So, uh, unfortunately, he does not qualify. Josh. Hmm. Well, the next guy, I know he had a lot of all-purpose yards, but I'm hoping he had enough rushing yards. But I'm kind of like 60% sure about it, but I'm going to go with Christian McCaffrey. Uh, Unfortunately, it's the 40% that was correct on this one, Josh. In that epic 2015 season, only three games over 200 rushing yards but many, many games over 200 all-purpose yards because of his uh, receiving and hey, skills. He would have rushed for over 200 in Iowa if they hadn't had to take him out of the game so early. Because <laughs> that one was over like two minutes into the second quarter? Yeah, pretty much. Awesome. Coach? Bryce Love. Ooh, Bryce Love. Uh, I'm, unfortunately, No. Uh, I know that Bryce Love seems to get all of uh, all of the love, ha ha ha. But no, he only had two games in which he was over two hundred last year. I hate you, Bryce Love. Uh, I have Josh. no love for you. <laughs> uh, should I complete the set and predict uh, or guess Toby Gerhardt? <laughs> Toby Gerhardt. Uh, I'm not going to. I'm not going to. Okay, no. <laughs> I, I, I would advise against this. <laughs> Oh, we were just listing Stanford back after Stanford back. Um, let's see. I am going to go with – did he do it in his magical freshman year, Jonathan Taylor? Uh, no, Jonathan Taylor tailback had uh, th- uh, three games last year. I know what you Man, I keep getting three out of four. This is a tough question. Since, since 2000. Um, this does include possibly one of the greatest, um, year, uh, 2k running backs. And that would be one Adrian Peterson. And I'm not talking about the one from Georgia Southern either. Adrian Peterson with only three in 2004, that freshman year of his. I know guys, this is a tough one. This is, this is a tough one. I have my game on this one. But we got some real good deep. We got some good deep cuts coming up. But a couple of guys you, you you should know. You should know. So Josh, it's on you. Okay. Well, there's 22 out there that we're not good at. Yeah. Um, another name that popped into my head is uh, Ezekiel Elliott. How is he on that list? <sighs> nope. Only three. You gotta be. Kidding. I'm dead this serious. Is ridiculous. I'm dead serious. So you both have three. I, you both have three strikes. So I just want rapid fire names now. Uh, uh, sorry, there was actually one player who did it twice. I, I did not specify. There was one player who did it twice, uh, who is still in the NFL after being more, there for more than ten years, and it's not Frank Gore. Le'Veon Bell? Nope. Josh, mm-hmm. you got any other names? I'm kind of grasping at straws, but um, Khalil Tate? That's a good one, but no. Can I take Freeman? Uh, <laughs> uh, no, not Devontae Freeman. So you got you guys have both struck out at this point. You're tied at 1-1. <laughs> one, one. So whoever gives me the next name that's on this list is, is the winner. Someone give me a name. I mean, I just guessed. It's on you, Coach. All right. Uh, it's got to be one of Bama's Heisman winners, Derrick Henry. That's correct. Derrick Henry. Nice. Derrick Henry had four in 2015. Names you missed. Uh, Rashad Penny. Oh, okay. I was going to say him. That was uh, my next guess. Uh, yeah, Rashad Penny last year had six games. Uh, Jamario Thomas from North Texas back in 2004 had six games. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Matt Forte in 2007 had five. Oh, Ryan, Ryan Motes. Had Ooh. five in 2004. Ryan uh, Moe. Patrick Smith in 2007, where he had that epic season for Central Florida. He wrote some great movies, too, like uh, Sin. 
Uh, I, I loved him. I, I loved him in Clerks. Uh, Led, guys, Ladanian Tomlinson? Come on now. Uh, he had five back in 2000. Michael the Burner Turner for the. Oh, Husky. I didn't. Re- I I thought okay. I I, I kind of thought Ladanian was out of his range, so I didn't even think about him. Uh, I, that's what I I got to admit. I was thinking the same thing, Coach. Yeah, yeah. I, I I don't blame you guys on that one. He's my favorite uh, running back of all time. Andre Williams at BC five years ago, BC. back in 2013, had no. five games. And the guy who the only person to do it twice. D'Angelo Williams at Memphis in oh. 2004 and 2005. Ooh. Four times in 2004, five times in 2005. Hmm. That was a tricky one, Matt. Yeah. Uh, then just the rest of the guys who had four, Amir Abdullah, Damian Anderson from Northwestern, Patrick Cobbs from North Texas, Tevin Coleman at Indiana, Leonard Fournette at LSU. Against the wrong Falcons back. Uh, Jerome Harrison from Washington State. Uh, Brian the Hill. Bus? From- Brian Hill from Wyoming, well, Michael James at Oregon, Grandmama Larry Johnson back at Penn State, A. A. Ron Jones at UTEP, and Garrett Wolf from Northern Illinois. Garrett Velvet Wolf. <laughs> oh man! All right, guys, uh, let's hit some deep roots. We are going to start uh, in the SEC where the Bayou Bengals went into Jordan Air on Saturday afternoon and came out with a last-second victory over Auburn 22-21. to Cole Tracy, the Assumption College transfer kicker, drilled a 42-yarder as time expired to give Kojo a big road win in the SEC West. Coach, how did LSU manage to slow down Jared Stidham and the rest of the Tiger offense on their way to this victory? Pressure. Um, just they were in his face all day long, it felt like. Um, and, yeah, just pressure, uh, mixing up coverages, uh, things like that. They were able to um, keep the keep the offensive line on the heels and, and really just shut down the run game for the most part and, and force Auburn to be one-dimensional. So, um, if you're ever in doubt, send pressure. Uh, so any any coaches that might be listening, when you're if you're in doubt, send pressure. And I say that over and over again, so maybe it'll stick. You know, so so you don't end up on uh, Josh's questionable coaching segment. Send pressure. Yeah, that's not a place you want to be. Uh, Josh, you know, I I was I was pretty impressed again by Joe Burrow. Uh, how did you feel like he did on, on Saturday? Yeah, he made some really clutch throws. Um, I think his stat line speaks for itself, but uh, to me, the gritty throws, uh, the tight windows, and the fact that his running attack, they got to 121 yards, but they needed 42 carries to get there. So, you know, Burroughs was accurate, clean on the interception list, Sweet in the tight windows and that offense on his back, quite honestly. This was not a vintage LSU running day. Yeah, it turns out that uh, they were getting quarterback transfers from the wrong Big Ten school. They were at <laughs> Purdue when they should have been at Ohio State the whole time. Obviously. But I, I think from from Auburn's perspective, you know, Coach mentioned the pressure that helped contribute to – Two interceptions thrown, so Auburn minus two in the turnover margin. Um, both teams had nine penalties, but Auburn had twenty, uh, yeah, twenty more yards with one hundred and eleven to ninety-one. So that's not very good. But the thing that caught my eye is um, it was a pretty rookie jerky game there in that second half. A lot of punts back and forth, um, and. There was an interesting play there in where uh, Auburn was uh, trying to find it. There it is. The, uh, the missed field goal. And it was a 52-yard uh, you know, field goal. And I didn't quite – get why they were doing that. So it's the end of the third quarter, uh, just into the fourth. Auburn has a fourth and five at their 30 at LSU's 35, and they attempt a 52-yard field goal. And their defense held, but from that point on, the field position favored LSU because the LSU three and out resulted in a 
punt, hitting Auburn deep. Auburn then just does three and outs the rest of the game. Uh, so LSU dominated time of possession. To me, I think if you want to be aggressive and chase some points, you put the game in Stidham's hands on a fourth and five and let him go to work. Or if you want to say, hey, our defense is rolling, why not punt and pin a very one-dimensional offense at this point, one that struggled to run the ball? Why not pin them deep in their own territory? It seemed like you've already got an eight-point lead chasing three points there. It seemed like the worst option to me. I, I was surprised to see that each team ended up with only one sack because I felt like both quarterbacks were just under constant pressure all game. And I felt like they were, if not getting sacked, getting knocked down on every single time they dropped back. So, you know, I, uh, but uh, again, I, I was happy to see LSU win this one. I've always sort of been a closet LSU fan, uh, but this was, this was a really big victory, I think, for Coach O going forward because even with the opening win, season win against Miami, I still think a lot of people, you know, really question, you know, the hiring of Coach O. And I think that in really using Coach O's strengths, uh, you know, in leaving sort of the scheming to his coordinators, especially Dave Miranda on defense, this LSU team ha- has enough innate talent to compete with anyone on any given Saturday. Well, they finally figured out the quarterback position, and that's that's just been really, really important. And yeah, you know, every, every time I feel like I do a, a conference preview of LSU, it's always, well, they're good everywhere else. They just don't have a quarterback that can that can cut it. And now they finally have a quarterback that can cut it. They have a they have a running back in Nick Brosette that can definitely I mean, he, cut it. The, the thing that impressed me about that though, like Brosette was not really that effective against Auburn. I mean, they stuffed him. No, I mean, all, I mean, there's not a whole lot of running backs there. But, but, but the, the fact that they Auburn. were able to get 22 points against a very talented Auburn defense on yeah. the road when their running game was averaging 2.9 yards per carry as a team, and Brosette was only 3.6 himself, like. Because Auburn's defense, Auburn's defense is very, very front heavy. You know, their their backs aren't very good. So if you can, if you can get time, you can you can pick them apart. Mm-hmm. If you can get just a shred of time, you can pick those guys apart. Mm-hmm. And and LSU was able to, and, and Burrow is good enough to make throws that other quarterbacks have not been able to make. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that's what that, really that, stuck I mean, out to me. That touchdown to Derek Dillon was oh, that was that was a great throw. Yeah, that, that was a great throw. And those are the throws that you never saw Danny Atling make. And those no. are the throws that, you know, these other guys get. And, and, and Burrow, I mean, Burrow still plays like a Big Ten quarterback as far as I'm concerned. I mean, 15 yeah. for 34, like those are Big Ten numbers right there. But, yeah. you know, he still has 240. But he makes the ones that count. Yeah, he, he actually averages more yards per attempt than Jared Stidham does, yeah. which is, you know, really one of the key underlying numbers here. And so, Auburn's so one-dimensional offensively. I mean, it is – it is so obvious that they miss carry on Johnson. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, that was, that might've been the most exciting game of the weekend, but we had a bunch of, uh, a bunch of other ones that were uh, really fun. Nonetheless, uh, let's head down to Jerry world in uh, where in the final game of urban Myers vacation, <coughs> I'm sorry. I mean, suspension, uh, the Buckeyes went down to the Dallas fourth work met- Metro area. The devil went down to Georgia. And, uh, and ran away from TCU in the second half. No, Urban wasn't on the trip. Oh, okay. All right. So the um, Devils stayed home in Columbus. Uh, but and, and they ran away from TCU in the second half. They won 40-28. Josh, TCU looked pretty good slowing down Ohio State's office in the first half. So what changed after the intermission? Mm-hmm. Their offense gave Ohio State points. They had... I mean, like in the first half, like like the defense was, you know, TCU yeah. defense was holding was hold, seemed to be holding down Ohio State pretty. Yeah, well. but the the Buckeyes had fourteen points from their defense. You, you take those out, TCU wins the game. Uh, okay. I, okay. I think I think the defense held up pretty well, all things considered, for all sixty minutes. TCU was just sloppy with the ball. TCU, you know, had the just asinine shuffle pass pick six. Um, I think TCU just made a, too many mistakes to, to win. They just weren't clean. I, 
I think in many aspects, TCU was the better team. They just were, you know, more turnover prone, three to none. Two of those turnovers were directly resulted in points. Um, If you're Ohio State, I think this game actually creates more questions than it answers. Ooh, okay. I'm liking this take, Josh. Go Because the Buckeye defense gave up a ton of big plays to Oregon State, and everyone just kind of said, well, they they were up by so much at at halftime, they didn't really care. And then they play Rutgers. Well, Rutgers couldn't move the ball on a junior high team, so who cares? TCU, next real opponent they play, they give up over 500 yards. They give up over 200 rushing yards. Uh, I mean, Trace McSorley is going to pick them apart. Like, you got to be scared if you're an Ohio State fan. They still have more horses than anyone else in the Big Ten to win this conference, but, you know, if they make the playoffs to attack of Alola, I mean, it's going to be a bloodbath. Blood this so Ohio State defense is not championship caliber. Yeah. No. no. It, it's not. And I, I think it's almost offensive that Ohio State's ranked ahead of Oklahoma, who I think would beat their – Beat the brakes off of them personally, um, but yeah, I mean, I, 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 I mean, I don't think I could say uh, anything that Josh didn't already say. I mean, this was Josh. That was a perfect analysis of, of what happened in this game. It just two asinine plays that just derailed TCU and gave all the momentum to the Buckeyes, and they ran away with it. So I, I don't know. Like, you know, you just got to take care of the ball better if if you're TCU. You've got to, you know, you've got to understand that you know, where you are and what the situation is and, and, and have, you know, sometimes better situational calls. Now I'm not going to say as an offensive coordinator that I've been perfect calling plays and, you know, I've had my fair share of, I call a play and all of a sudden here, here goes a pick six, but I mean, it, it's, it's shovel pass against, uh, you know, in a heavy run blitz situation. Yeah, of course there's going to be a lot of pressure on it and yeah, there's a good chance it's going to get picked off. So, um, I don't – that's why I'm not really a big fan and a big proponent of of the shovel pass for that reason. And, well, it showed right there. So, you know, with with the Horned Frogs, that's a dangerous team. That's a team that I didn't think going through the previews – I didn't think that going through the previews um, that they would necessarily be the team to challenge Oklahoma or that anybody was really going to be able to challenge Oklahoma, but I might be wrong here. You know, TCU is going to give Oklahoma everything they, everything they want and more. Um, so one, one thing that Ohio state did that impressed me was they, their <clears throat> kick coverage was phenomenal. Kevante Turpin is one of the best returners in all of college football. I've talked about him more times than I can count. He had five returns for 56 total yards and a long of 19. This is a guy who last year averaged better than 35 yards per return. Well, you know the problem, Matt? What's that? He didn't fake any fair catches. <laughs> so, yeah, and, I, you know, I, I'm a big fan of Turpin. Turpin didn't uh, – he's a guy that they've utilized in jet sweeps before. He didn't touch the ball uh, running. He caught four passes only for 14 yards. You know, he, he wasn't able to get loose on, on a big play there. Jalen Rager was okay uh, catching the ball. But anyway, yeah, TCU, I don't, think, I don't think they have anything to really be ashamed about in this one other than boneheaded mistakes, and, you know, those happen. So let's head then over to a little Pac-12 after dark. A little bit of a letdown, honestly. Washington just simply suffocated Utah en route to a 21-7 to win. The Utes shot themselves in the foot so many times in this one. I'm still sticking with Utah, by the way, after this game as my Big Ten, uh, as my Pac-12 South champ. I'm not, I'm, not go- I'm not leaving the Utes. But, man, two lost fumbles, an interception, and three consecutive turnovers on downs, all within Washington territory, two of which – or inside the red zone, one at like the two yard line. Uh, so they had three consecutive turnovers and down to end the game. Josh, I know that the Huskies still won this one, but this Washington team still doesn't quite feel like offense is at the level that it has been over the past couple of years. No, and I think, you know, it's easy to 
highlight all the receiving talent that's no longer there. But, you know, I, I was a big defender of Jake Browning a year ago, and this season just doesn't feel like he's, you know, a senior leader. Doesn't feel like he's taken that next step. No, and, and one other thing I want to throw in there, sorry to cut you off there, but the offensive line has not been good this year. No. The offensive line is supposed to be the strength of this offense with the running game of Miles Gaskin. And Trey Adams has been hurt, and that team does not look the same without him anchoring that line. Yeah. And I mean, the good thing for Washington is they've got a elite, elite defense. So, you know, you're kind of thinking, all right, they can just tread water for a few weeks, shore some things up, figure out some things schematically uh, to survive the O-line not playing well and, and kind of patch together a, a better, more functional offense. But yeah, I, I think at this point you have to wonder what, you know, why has Jake Browning plateaued in such a way that I, I can't think of a, another quarterback to have done this where they are a Heisman Trophy candidate two years ago, and this year you're wondering, like, is he going to play the entire season as the starter? It's very weird. Um I mean, but, he has to because Jacob Eason is eligible yet. <laughs> <you know? laughs> um, but, yeah, Matt, I mean, you brought up all the missed opportunities for – for Utah, and I think part of that comes down to the, you know, I, I feel like Utah didn't fully trust their running game. They they only rushed the ball 29 times. They had a pretty respectable 4.2 yards per carry, which against that Washington defense I think is plenty good. Um, Zach Moss, a pretty good running back, only got 13 carries. Uh, they had Huntley, who's – yeah, he's a dynamic dual-threat quarterback. He's a nice college athlete, um, but I don't think he's going to, like, wow he's you not, with his he's not, Michael, he's not Michael Vick out there. I mean, he, exactly. And and to only, to only rush it 29 times when they're having a little bit of success versus throwing it 38 times – I'm confused about the offensive balance right there. Coach? Yeah, I mean, I just thought, you know, watching Washington, their defense just bailed them out, really. And, you know, I I think that Utah, had they not had such a giant cluster blank of turnovers and untimely penalties where, uh, especially one of those roughing the passer calls on Jake Mm -hmm. Browning, Mm-hmm. Really just derailed one of their drives. I, I thought they could have won this game, and I, I thought at times they were the better team. Um, but you know, Washington just, you know, they they played better defense and they made plays when it mattered, and they got and they took advantage of timely penalties. So, um, hats off to Washington. But um, I know why. I know another reason why you're sticking with your Utes, and that would be uh, one of the other teams on our list. So. Yeah, well, you know what? Well, we'll, we'll switch up the order. Let's let's get to them right now. Um, the road woes continued for USC as they went into Austin and got stampeded by the Longhorns. Uh, after starting out quick in the first quarter, uh, you know, two quick scores, 14 points on the board, Trojans couldn't get anything going after that. Uh, but I honestly think Texas' MVP for the game was probably my new favorite game, my, my new favorite name in college football, Dicker the Kicker. Uh, Cameron Dicker, three for three on field goals, four for four on extra points. Uh, Josh, you have long been skeptical about Tom Herman's program. So what happened in this one that made them look so much better than they had so far this season? Because they're playing a team with an even more skeptical coach. <laughs> has, Clay Helton, yeah, has Clay Helton proved to anyone that he can build a team? I mean... He inherited an absolutely out-of-this-world talent at quarterback. I could have coached Sam Darnold. So, I mean, good for Texas, but one game doesn't reverse a trend. And I think the famous call of Joe Tessitore, Texas is back after they beat Notre Dame, and they promptly fired their coach later that season. Like, it's one game. Don't worry about it. USC has a freshman quarterback. USC's their own mess. Let me know if you think 
Texas has turned anything around when they get blown out in the Red River rivalry. Uh, Coach, how do you feel about, uh, about, about these rushing stats for USC? As a team, 16 carries for negative five yards. Ooh. Mm. Makes me feel some type of way. By the way, Stephen Carr and Cedric Ware, both of whom are very good tailbacks. Stephen Carr, after Cam Akers and Najee Harris, I think was the number three tailback in that class, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, yeah, you are mistaken. DeAndre Swift was uh, That's right. the third, and then Carr, I believe. Sorry, so it was a fourth. Still, you know, it, it, among that class, you know, an elite tailback. Uh, in this game, he had six carries. He was leading rusher, six carries for 13 yards. Hmm. Well, uh, that just shows you how how well USC blocks. So uh, 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 that just – that every every – Good thing I said about USC was just completely deflated in this game. JT Daniels, they just, I mean, honestly, it just stems from the fact that they couldn't get anything going. Anything going. And, you know, that, you know, that's troublesome for USC. But but my question is, okay, they have, you know, three of their of their sixteen rushes of the team were sacked for uh, JT Dan. So you, you you cross those out. They only attempted thirteen running plays. And I'm sorry, but you have a kid who was supposed to be a senior in high school playing on the road in Austin. I don't care even if Texas is down. You're still playing, you know, in Austin. Why are you only going thirteen designed runs in the entire freaking game? Yeah, you, you can't put that much on on a kid like that. Um, that's just that's just asking for for trouble. I mean, if you're going to put the put the ball in the hands of even a true freshman who's supposed to be a true freshman and not a senior in high school, that on the road in a big environment, which Texas could be Rutgers, he could go on the road at Rutgers <laughs> and still uh, be kind of questionable. Although that would probably end very quickly. Um, but I mean, anybody can find lightning in a bottle and 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 stop you. So it, I just I don't like it. You've got to be more balanced. You've got to take pressure off of JT Daniels. It's obvious that when you put the game on his shoulders, he's not equipped to, to handle it. Now, if he was a junior, senior, you know, in college, yeah, okay, fine. Put it on his shoulders. Let him carry you. Let him see what he can do on the road. But he's not. He's a he's he's a young cat, and he's never been in this situation before. He's never been in an environment as hostile and as big and and as hot and humid. Just everything was working against him uh, when when they traveled to Austin because there's 105,000 fans. I don't know. I don't know if you guys ever been to Austin, Texas. It's hot year round. So actually, that that that, that uh, before we get into our last game, that actually brings up a question I want to ask both you guys. Um, False. One of the problems False. with USC quarterbacks traditionally that, you know, a lot of these guys are Southern California kids and they've grown up playing football where it's always 65 and, you know, 65, 75 degrees and like no humidity. Do you think that, you know, with the environment changes that you get going on the road in college when you're not playing at home at, you know, at SC, uh, is that sort of the factor in why a lot of these guys have struggled on the road? Absolutely. I mean, it, weather conditions are a factor for a reason. I mean, these guys have never experienced cold. So you think the first time they play in a cold weather game, they're going to handle it very well? Yeah, no. you know, you're playing at Colorado or Washington State in November. Yeah, these guys have never played in extreme heat. So the first time they travel to a game in the desert or in Texas or in that southwestern climate, yeah, they're not going to handle it very well. They're going to be dehydrated. They're going to be cramping up, and, and they're going to be it, – it's over. All right, rain. You go up to the Pacific Northwest and play against UW, and it's it starts raining like it does ninety eight percent of the year. You think they're going to be able to handle that? Nope. Are they going to be able to play in the snow on, on the Palouse? Maybe after they're not on their first start there, not on their first experience there, they're going to struggle. Yeah. Weather weather conditions are a factor for. A reason. Even in the even in the fog at Corvallis, like you know, yeah. that, that's mean, a problem. All right, 
Well, um, let's head then, I guess, towards now our final game of the weekend uh, in what for was, for me, one of the most shocking scores of the day. Oklahoma State absolutely pummeled Boise State in Stillwater, 44-21. to uh, But it wasn't the air raid attack that we've come to know under uh, Coach Mullet, but instead uh, it was a rushing attack led by Justice Hill and some solid defense for the Pokes that led to, uh, you know, at least in the second half, that led to the win. Coach, what were you most surprised by in this one? Special teams. Um, Boise State's usually so strong in special teams. They yeah, the uh, block touchdown. Yeah, that, that, that stood out to me the most. It's the two like, blocks. Mm-hmm. The yeah. two blocks and one for the score. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, the, the one for the score really got me. But, um, yeah, just having the two blocks and the, you know, Boise – Boise has prided itself and has made a living doing those things right, being flawless at special teams, having great special teams, having that be an actual weapon for you. And to have it come back and turn and backfire on them was the biggest biggest shocker. Because, I mean, Oklahoma State is a very tough place to play. All right, it's one of those places that you wouldn't think is so – is you know, where you wouldn't think the heat and the weather would be a factor, but it absolutely is. That turf gets to about 140 degrees. You can feel your feet melting. It's it's bad, all right? The fans are on top of you, so not only are you hot and tired and you're dehydrated, but the fans are about a foot and a half from you, and they're banging on the pads with those big giant paddles, and it can get loud in a hurry. Yeah, um, yeah uh, Josh, um but yeah, Brett, Brett, Brett Rippin was sacked seven times. Yeah, I mean, I cannot remember a, a Boise State quarterback getting sacked even three times in a game, much less seven. Yeah, I mean, Oklahoma State was doing stuff against Boise's front that just is criminal in some areas. I mean, you mentioned the sacks, but just overall running the ball, um, the leading rusher for Boise. Uh, Alexander Madison had just 53 yards on 14 carries. Um, uh, and as a team, they had 34 yards. Yeah, I mean, once you factor back in those sacks, 34 yards for, on 31 carries. Uh, I mean, Rippon Rippin showed that he's going to be a pretty good quarterback at the next level. He kept Boise single-handedly in it. He 39 of 56, 380, three touchdowns, zero interceptions. But why is Boise throwing 56 times? I mean, that that is – I mean, I, I know that they shut him down rushing, but my God, 56 I – mean, that's a lot for Boise. Yeah, but they, they couldn't move the ball running at all, and then, you know, then they're playing catch-up with some of the special teams issues. You know, uh, entering the fourth quarter, this game was 34-21. So, I mean, you got to score – got to score in a hurry – uh, try and get back in that game. Uh, I, I think it just uh, – it was a little bit like TCU where some stuff just kind of snowballed against Boise State and they got out of what they really wanted to do. And, and this sport is unforgiving if you don't – if you're not the team dictating how the game goes, you're not going to win. And, and Boise just – enough stuff piled up against them that they weren't able to dictate their game plan to Oklahoma State. and. You know, I think much like TCU's good showing against Ohio State, I think this forces us to reevaluate Big 12. I I think Oklahoma State has a much better shot three games in than we would have thought three weeks ago Mm -hmm. at at dethroning. Even after their first game of the season. Even after their first game of the season. Because, I mean, mean, they they played two pretty – pretty poor opponent. So we still didn't know what they were going to have at quarterback. Yeah. And even though he's not putting up huge numbers, Taylor Cornelius has been efficient. Um, I, I will say this, and it's actually much more of a question, but uh, Boise uses that three man wedge thing snap where, so you snap the ball and then you let some guys go, but they block. And so shield I, point. I, I have hated that formation. Whatever I saw. For, for, for as long as I've known you. you, you and, you, and, I, and Coach, I have a conspiracy theory. My conspiracy theory is anytime you want to block a punt, you can in that formation. Is that the truth? 
Uh, no, because we use that. <laughs> form. You know, we haven't had one blocked yet. So none of your other opponents have wanted to block one. <laughs> <laughs> well, we we haven't played Hillsboro yet, but they they definitely tried to block a few last year. But uh, they coach. I've seen, but I I see you guys quick kick a lot too, though. Yeah, we do. But when I we will... actually punt, we use this the the shield punt with the three elephant. We call they call it elephants with the three elephants. You widen the a gap and and really just take. I, I, the the idea behind it is you you put the big hogs in the middle and you spread out the a gap and let everyone you want rush up the middle, but you protect the edges and theoretically it's supposed to be good. But when you don't protect the edges, this that punt formation is just about useless. All right. Well, I think that is going to just about do us do it for us here tonight. Uh, Josh, any final words? Yeah, we uh, we buried the lead, you guys. Um, How did we manage to do that? So I I had a typo in my notes. I had that North Texas took on Central Arkansas. Uh, mm. They actually they actually took on uh, SEC adjacent member. Arkansas, <laughs> and uh, things didn't go well. And I think I know what this coaching staff needs to do this week in practice. What's that? Uh, they need to bring in an optometrist and determine if their quarterbacks have any sort of color blindness because they threw six interceptions. That's and a lot. Yeah, and, and Texas is not exactly known for having like the world's greatest day. Yeah, and uh, John Stephen Jones, uh, Jerry Jones's uh, grandson, who, based on this stat line, I can only assume got the job from nepotism, but uh, he went zero of three for with one interception. So, um, good day all around for. Yeah, for so the he still had a better QBR than Nathan Peterman. <laughs> I think I had a better QBR than Nathan Peterman. <laughs> Coach, a final words from you? Uh, speaking of quarterbacks and QBRs, uh, Hale Page was uh, Sport Sports Nashville's Player of the Week, throwing for 342 yards and four touchdowns, um, albeit in a loss. But um, he's moved up to 14th in the nation in passing. So uh, 14th in the country. Uh, in passing, I'll say that again. Uh, number one in the country is Jeff Widener from Apple Valley, California. Uh, and see if there's any other no, notable names in front of him. Uh, no, none that I've seen. No and, Bo Nicks, no Graham Mertz. Let's see. Let's see where Graham Mertz is. Anthony Munoz is fifth overall. He's not playing tackle for the Bengals? No. Uh, Blake Kirshner from Santa Clarita Christian. He's uh, 12th. And he's only uh, less than 20 yards away from, from Hale. The leader is at 1737. That's Jeff Widener. All right. Well, uh, on that note, uh, I think that's going to end it for us here today on the Illegal Motion College Football Podcast. So, on behalf of the coach, Corey Burton, in Nashville, Tennessee, and our third amigo in the second city, our intrepid blogger from Big Ten and counting, Josh Cook, up there in the Windy City. This is the professor in Nashville saying so long and see you next time on the Illegal Motion College Football Podcast. I bet Arkansas gets a bunch of targeting penalties now. Thanks for listening to the Illegal Motion College Football Podcast. To get in touch with the show, email us at illegalmotionpodcast at gmail.com or follow us on Twitter at illegal underscore motion.